guys. Welcome to Best Practices Show. My name is Kirk Barrett, and I am your host. And have you ever thought to yourself, you know what? I got to figure out this case presentation thing or selling or whatever we call it. How do I get the patients to say a little bit more yes of to what I do and what I can help them with? Well, if you've ever had those questions, I've got a great friend of mine, Dr. Leonard Tao on today. And we're going to be talking about the art of selling in dentistry. What is it? How to gain more acceptance, more trust with patients. And you are going to love this. So don't miss this. So make sure you stick around, hit the share button, grab a pen, take some notes. You'll love this. Now, number one, if you're just joining us for the first time in the podcast, I want to just welcome you to showing up to a community where we're just all here to learn and uh, we'll be sharing some great thoughts. I want to encourage you to, to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. I don't care if it's on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, whatever. So if you're listening to Spotify right now, just go down to the subscribe button, hit the subscribe button. You'll see because every single week I'm going to bring you a brand new key opinion leader in dentistry, just like Lynn today. And I don't want you to miss it. So I want you to show up, keep hanging out with us. Also, if you haven't joined our private Facebook group, I'm going to encourage you to join us over there because it is just a fun place to be. And you're going to see we've got dentists helping dentists where, um, you know, we don't even really know how we're working it, but it's working right now. And there's over 13,000 of you that are in there. Continue to ask great questions. You're going to see it's just a great, great community of people. And lastly, if you are just a dentist and you're just like, what do I do with my practice? I want to encourage you to join us over at actdental.com. We're a practice coaching company. Got a lot of resources over there, Act Dental U. Actually, there's a masterclass tomorrow, how to find the right people, put them in the right seats. You do not want to miss that. Also, um, if you just have questions around your practice or you just want somebody to speak to, we are always here to help. So make sure you check that out. We also do a lot of show notes. So after this is over, you're going to see everything that Len and I talk about I'm going to hand it over to our writers. Our writers are going to write all of this up and all the links, lens information, all that will be just there. I'm going to make this learning as easy as possible for you. So again, if you're just listening on your phone, you can just swipe up to the show notes and you can see what we talked about there and click on those links. Now, I want to introduce my guest because he's been a friend of mine for a long time. Len, I've known you for a long time. I was just on your podcast like about an hour ago. And um, we were talking about this. I met you at the Greater New York Dental Meeting. It was with your dad. And it was so cool to watch you. Now, not only are you a fabulous dentist, but you teach all, about a lot of things, social media, selling in dentistry. Um, I really love your story, even what you're doing now. And now you're a great speaker out there. You've been speaking at a lot of these meetings. But if somebody doesn't know who Dr. Leonard Tao is, let's start there. And then we'll talk about the topic. Who's Dr. Leonard Tao? Well, I'm a dentist, as you <laughs> nicely stated. I actually I practice in Philadelphia. I have a fee-for-service practice um, there. started uh, just shy of 15 years ago. Um, bought a practice who had passed away. Um, and I rebranded the practice, um, started uh, learning how to do online marketing. Um, fast forward a couple of years, started my own uh, reputation company uh, called iSocial Reviews, helping dentists um, basically get better reviews online. Um, fast forward a couple more years, that resulted in me uh, or having BirdEye, a company that I currently run the dental division for, um, acquiring my company uh, about a year and a half after I started it. Um, I've been speaking for for almost 10 years now, a little over 10 years now, um, at a lot of different conferences around the country. Um, so I basically say I'm a dentist part-time because I work Monday and Tuesday. Um, I'm a, a speaker, a consultant. I help dentists with their reputation, like I said. Uh, I have a podcast, which you commented on. You were just on it. Uh, I wrote a book, so I'm an author. So I've got my, my hands in a lot of different things right now. Um, and uh, the best part about it, I eloquently put on my podcast is I love what I do, but I'm still enjoying my life. Um, I just moved to Florida, um, back in October. So a couple months ago. And, uh, so I commute up to my practice on a weekly basis. There was a big snowstorm this week, so I did not go up. And, um, so de part-time dentist, but, um, basically a friend an educator helper, whatever is needed for me in the industry. Yeah. So our next podcast is going to be on 
how you can live where you want to and keep your business intact where you started it. So that'll be a good one. I just love your story and the fact that you're living in Florida now, you get to do what you want to do. Um, it's awesome. But I want you to talk about the why. Today, we're going to be talking about the art of the sale or selling. Some people don't like the word selling in dentistry, you know, like, let's talk about why this is so important because it, I'll just start here. I think everybody sells something, right? I go to church on Sunday and pastor sells something. I have four kids that hard sell me every day. Like, let's talk about the why before we get into the how. You know, why is it such an important topic? Because if people don't say yes, patients don't say yes to treatments, they walk out of the office and they go somewhere else. So, you know, we talked about some key, uh, uh, KPIs on my podcast. And, you know, one of the KPIs is case acceptance. Um, how, how many, what percent of your patients are saying yes to treatment and a healthy practice has a really good case acceptance. Uh, unhealthy practice has a poor case acceptance and people walk out and they go somewhere else and they spend their money elsewhere. So I have actually been, I'm a very good salesperson. Um, I teach, um, you know, a lot of different things, but I, I pride myself in, in taking my time and getting, you know, my clients or my patients to say yes to whatever I'm, I'm selling them. Uh, I, I'm not a used car salesman. I don't do it in a way that's not, that's not correct or not fair or wrong. But um, I think that, you know, if your patients are walking out of your office and they say maybe, or, you know, I need to speak to my husband, um, we're not doing a very good job of getting them to the ultimate spending money in your practice. And that's the most important thing, in my opinion, is, is getting that patient to say, I'm coming in, I'm doing it, let's get started. And I want to pay for it as well. So my why, the why is you've got to grow your practice. Patients need to say yes. You can only make so much money from the recare and the, the small things that come through the office. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, this is always an interesting topic in dentistry and that's why I love having you on so I can dish you the hard questions. But I think the first thing is what you said. I think money spent on dentistry, is some of the best money people could ever invest. You know, that's just one of the things I think, first of all, what we do in dentistry is incredibly valuable for people. This isn't about how to trick people or get fancy with your words. I think the first thing is just get your head right. That What you do is very important to people, don't you think? A hundred percent. So, I mean, I definitely think what we do is very important, but you know, patients say no. And a lot of times they say no. And I, I've come up with five reasons that patients say no to treatment, you know, and one of them is they just don't value the, uh, see the value that, or understand the value and what you're proposing to them. So, right. um, I think that's a really important thing, um, that you have to make sure you know, you do is you have to create the value for the patients because if I, if you create the value for the patients, the patients will say yes. So right. if they find value in what you're offering them, in my opinion, they're going to choose you and spend the money in your practice. So, I mean, that's a big deal in my, in my mind. Yeah. But let me, let me, I'm going to play the 32 year old dentist. Who's like, okay, a little nervous. I just went to dentist dental school. Cause I like working on teeth. You know, I didn't bargain for this. I, I bought this practice. I didn't know that I was going to have to communicate with people and like help them understand why they'd have to buy dentistry. You know, is that a tough transition for people? I mean, did you go through that? Did you have some stumbles communicating that way? So, so it's a very interesting story. So um, when I bought my practice, uh, staff of the previous dentist ended up staying. And um, my office manager, um, in my opinion, at that point, I it was 14 years ago, it was very different, very different personality. But my office manager basically ran the office, in my opinion. I was, I was almost an employee in my own practice. That's how I felt. Um, and you know, she said, this is the way we do it. I just bought the practice. That's the way I did it. I, I didn't come in there and say, I'm the dictator. This is how we're doing things. Um, it turns out, um, patients would come in my office. They would be really excited by what I would propose to them. She would go in, go in as a treatment, you know, slash financial coordinator. Patients would, would walk out and say, I'll think about it. And I'm like, where's the disconnect here? Okay. Um, so the, Fortunately or unfortunately, um, she ended up um, leaving the practice about a year and a half later. And that gave me the opportunity to be very comfortable learning how to talk to patients about money, being how to um, comfortable talking to patients about treatments. So in my office for the last 13 years, I've been, when I'm there, I've been the treatment and uh, financial coordinator, and I even discussed the money with the patients. So I know that when patients, I know when I have to push the buttons the right way, I, I know when I, when they're going to not be interested and I can tell, and you know, the conversation ends fairly quickly, or I know when I 
I have to push to get people to say yes. So I handle that in my office. So I've had a, a very interesting story there is that I do that and most dentists don't want to do it. You know, right. as you know, most of the consultants out there, the gurus in the space say, no, no, don't talk about, you know, your fees that's left for somebody else in the office. That's, I do that in my office. So I have that very unique ability to, to discuss finances with the patients. And, and I'm very good at doing that as well. Yeah. Well, that begs my first question is, and I get these questions all the time. So I'm in addition to you, like, should the doctor talk money or should it be a team member? I, you, I get these all the time. I mean, take us through your answer a little bit deeper about that. Well, I, I think if you, if I had someone who I felt comfortable doing it and was, was an expert in doing it, I would let them do it. Um, I found over the years that I'm the one that is very good at doing that, uh, especially because I talk money in multiple capacities. And I had to do it when I was an associate in my other practice. So I came in with that expertise. Most dentists don't like to do it. I think you need to learn how to do it because ultimately the patients trust you. They right. come into the office, they trust you, they want to hear what they need, why they need it, and the cost involved. And if you can keep it to one single person, I think you eliminate a lot of the issues with patients having an opportunity to say, I want to think about it or no. Um, so like I said, I, I've, I'm very comfortable doing it. Um, I now teach a class on, on how to have these discussions with the patient, proper verbiage, proper body language, um, things not to say, um, and how to follow up with them if they say no. So like I said, I've just found my niche. My niche is the, is the customer service that I provide, um, the way that patients can reach out to me, they feel comfortable. And when patients feel comfortable and they understand the value, the money is not necessarily the, the biggest issue. Patients can find the money if they see the value. And, right. and so if you can connect those dots and you get to the end where you know, they tell you the price, you know, a lot of times it's, it's expensive dentistry but many times they are able to find the money or you're able to find the money for them using financing that's available to them. So right. like I said, I feel comfortable in my environment. If you feel comfortable talking about money, I think that the dentist should take the time to do that because I think their case acceptance will increase. Okay. So let's, we'll start with your methodology now um, and we'll break it down in a real simple fashion. I know you teach this in a, in a comprehensive manner, how to be better at this, but let's do this simple short course. If you're somebody like me, who's been clinically diagnosed as a wuss, you know, like you're just afraid, where do I start, Len? Like, where would I, where would I even start to put a framework in here to get better at, you know, possibly selling more dentistry or talking about more dentistry? So I think it actually starts with, and, and I, when I give my seminar, I ask, um, and excuse me, when I give the workshop, I ask people to tell me what makes you different. Okay. What makes you different in your practice? And I, I, I've had to like guide them and say, this is not clinical based. I don't want a clinical answer to this. What makes me very different is that when someone reaches out to my office, I respond immediately. I am, I'm, I have a web chat on my website. I'm the one doing the web chat. I get, gather that trust because the art of the sale actually starts with the first interaction with the practice. Now, I'm not worried. What well, I want to be clear here, Kirk, is that I'm not talking about a hygiene, hygiene patient who needs some dentistry. I'm talking about the new patients who are reaching out to your practice to bring new blood into the practice. How do you handle them? That art of the sale starts in the very first interaction I have with them. And many times that's when they call in the office or they chat on my website. And I'm the one who answers those. I, I call new patients. I get them to trust me, to trust what I do. They've read my online reviews, so they already have the credibility online. Okay? Right. So... I want to, I call it um, a, a process of basically um, uh, getting the patients to relax in the chair enough where you can get them to say yes to treatment. And that's, it's called disarming the patient. And when you disarm the patient, you have to find if they are a wuss and you, you said you're a wuss, you're a patient, right. you come in, you're a wuss. Okay. What's the first thing you're scared about? You're scared about pain. You're scared about, you know, needles. You're scared about money. Money is a big thing. So a lot of times on that first call I have with them and they, they I'll give you, a, I'll give you an exact answer as uh, example of to what happened with a patient, new patient calls the office, or excuse me, chats with my website, um, says that I, I need to see a dentist. I haven't been to dentist in many, many, many years. And a lower tooth just fell out of my mouth. That's what the person said to me. And she says, I want to have a virtual converse conversation with the dentist. So this was during COVID. Okay. So I called her immediately. I introduced myself. And I can tell that she was even nervous talking to me. You know, you have those phobic patients. Right. And I said, can you tell me what happened? And she said, I was eating something and my tooth just fell out. And she said it, she was a 75-year-old woman. She had not been to the dentist in over 30 years. 
Okay, that's a long time. Right. So you knew if a tooth just falls out, <laughs> you know that there's probably periodontal problems. Okay, it isn't just a simple, oh, I broke a, I broke a chip, a tooth, I need a little filling. This is gonna right. be some major dentistry she needs. So my, I told her that, let's bring you in. We're not gonna do anything at all. We're just gonna do a consultation, take some x-rays and talk. How does that feel? Because they think they come in and they're gonna start getting work done. You know, we don't do that too often. Right. So she said, I'm okay, if, as long as we don't do any work. And um, I, can I say, I, during my wadir, as I call it, my conversation with her, I learned that it's been a long time. She works in a, in a pediatric medical office. Um, and like I said, we, got, we, we made that connection before she even walked in the office. Okay. So again, patients don't say yes to treatment because they don't feel a connection to the office. I connect with the patients before they even come in. Okay. Now on the phone with her, I said, it sounds like you may need a lot of dentistry. So what I would like you to do is determine it when you come in, how much of a monthly payment that you can afford for your dentistry. So if we need to wow. spread out payments, I know how much you can, because if you can't tell me that I can't help you get money that you may need. Okay. Right. So we made an appointment for the good. No, so, so you tell them to consider budget before they even come in. When I'm on the phone with them like this and I know, and I know they need a lot of work done. And this has been, I do this on every patient and it's a pretty consistent result. That's why I continue to do it. Wow. So, so I have that, I say, just all I want you to do is think of a budget. Um, I don't ask them about their credit score until they come in the office, but think about a budget, think about how much money you can apply to your dental work when we first meet each other. So she came in, a, she was a very short little lady, very nice, but you can tell she was nervous even walking in. We took the, took the x-rays, she needed scaling root planing, she needed her four lower anterior teeth extracted, she would not get implants done. So we, her canines were really strong. So we needed a six unit bridge. She needed about four other teeth extracted. So treatment was about $15,000. Okay. okay. And I can, like I said, I had that, I can tell when, you know, she's comfortable and I literally presented the treatment to her, I explained to her how I would, would do it, the steps we would take. And I spent the time doing that myself. And then I, I said, you know, I know on the phone that I had asked you about budgets. And right. you know how you can afford, she goes, well, I, I listened to you. I looked at my budget and I can spend $700 a month on dentistry. Okay. So it, one of the things I'm very good at is you, and one of the things I, ha I recommend your, your listeners do is if you're offering any type of financing and they're doing no interest, you have to know how much month of money someone can afford. So if someone tells you I can afford $300 a month over 24 months, that's $7,200, $3,600 a year. Okay. Right. If it's 400, you have to know the numbers. If you don't know the numbers, you have to take a calculator out and figure out those numbers. I know those numbers like the back of my hand. Okay. So she needed $15,000 in treatment. If she's spending $700 a month, okay, that's $8,400 a year, which is $17,000. So I knew she can fit that budget within a two years, no interest. Right. Okay. So then I said to her, I said, how's your credit? She goes, my credit's perfect. Why? I go, well, I can get you a payment for less than $700 over 24 months. How does that sound? She goes, if that's the case, Let's go, let's get going. I went on to care credit site, helped her apply. And I, by the way, I do that as well. And we can talk about that in a little bit, uh, uh, some power tips on, on how I'm involved with the financing part of it. But I went online with her, got her approved and she left the office spending 15, pay, prepaying $15,000. So, yeah. you know, that's kind of the process I go through with patients. I take the time to spend with them because it's a lot of money for me. It is, it is. That is going to be a, I, I want to do a whole show on the whole care credit thing because I have my own opinions. A lot of people say, oh, they, they just don't know how to utilize it. They don't know how to think like this because answer, answer this, this is true or false. Len, you're not negating what they say. You're going to take whatever they give you and you're going to put the pieces together, right? Like it's not about no, 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 or yes, yes, yes. Just, I want you to think about this. I'm going to take what you have. And let's start talking about your health, what you need, and put it together in something that works for you, right? Yep. And it has to have to understand the value. They have to respect. I, I want to be respectful of the, the money they can afford. So if she came in and said, look, I can afford $300 a month. Okay, $300 a month, okay, is $7,200. She's not going to pay for $15,000 with $7,200, no interest. She can't, okay? Right. So then I have to look at what other options are. So I've had people that need a lot more dentistry and, and can't afford that much. And I have plans that I can get them that will spread payments out over 36 or 48 months. And it, they do get charged interest, okay? They do, and they, and they recognize that. But these people sometimes don't have another way to get the money anyway, and they need the dental work done. So this, this, this process of me speaking with them, getting to know them better, getting them to, to um, trust me, um, getting them to disarm in the chair allows me to get them to say yes a lot of the times, as long as I can get them money. If I can't get them money, they have horrible credit and I can't get them money, then the situation changes because then they can't afford the treatment. Right.
Right. Now, I want to go back to one thing that you said. You said call chat versus chat. Like that is something most dentists don't understand. A lot of people are still stuck in the, the phone thing. I think the phone is crazy important. But now a dentist, like go back to that. How much call versus chat do you get on your site? And how important is that in the first component of selling? Like one of the, one of the most important things that I've, I've ever added to my website was a chat button. So I've was, I'm an early adopter. I'm a tech guy. Okay. I I've had a chat on my website since 2012. So nine years now of, of one way or another, I first had a company called, uh, call, I can't remember the first name of the company, but it, they, they, they were, they closed down after a few years. I switched to another company. So I had a managed chat service and I remember, and I'll give you, tell you a quick story. Um, I, was giving an Invisalign seminar in Calgary on Calgary, Canada, and went on my website and chatted and says, "I have my teeth are loose. I need a. I want a full mouth set of extractions and, and a, like an all on four. Um, I've reached out to other practices. Nobody's gotten back to me. The second I got that call or that chat, I called them from Calgary and told them I was in Calgary. So obviously, they're very impressed with that. The woman ended up spending thirty thousand dollars in my office because I was I connected with her right away." So the chat allows me another opportunity to reach out to patients who are trying to interact with the practice. Patients who are scared don't necessarily call the practice. They're going to right. chat with you online. So I, I've made so much money because of the chat and I've had it for such a long time. So I believe a chat service on your website is one of the most important lead generation tools that you can have. Right. Because people call it all out. You get those chats at all hours. Yeah. I just got a chat. Um, Two weeks ago, 12, 18 in the morning, I'm sitting on my phone and someone says, um, my mom, my mom uh, is a patient in your office. Um, I've been told for many years I need veneers on my six front teeth. Um, I, my insurance isn't active yet, but can, when, when can I get in to make an appointment for a consultation? I texted her at 12, 19 when she was at, at 12, 18. She was so impressed that I took the time at that time of night to chat with her. She came in the following week and spent $7,500 in my office. Wow. That's awesome. That is awesome. So let's break down some other components. What do dentists get wrong in looking at the art of selling? Well, they don't listen. So one of the, so there's five wait, reasons. Wait, I, wait, 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 what are you saying? I don't know what you're saying. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> we don't listen. Dentists, I was a horrible, horrible, horrible listener. So I've, I've had a coach um, uh, help me when I first bought the practice and she would wa watch my treatment presentation. And she said, Len, you don't listen to your patients. I'm like, of course you do. She goes, Len, you need to record yourself and watch because you're not listening. So I actually took a listening class. Okay. I, I was coached to listen better. And now I'm a great listener. I always say that the only person I don't listen to is my wife. I have selective hearing. So um, of course that's a joke, but right. the point is one of the reasons is that you don't listen to your patients. And I teach something in this workshop called the art of active listening. And active listening is a a, a process that you go through to ensure the patients know that you're listening. So it involves what I refer well, it involves uh, five steps, paying attention, showing that you're listening, using some nods and saying, yeah, uh -huh, nodding, responding appropriately, providing feedback to the patient and deferring judgment. So there's a step and you can look it up online. It's called active listening, but I took a class on this and I studied it. And now I am a, an amazing listener. If you read the reviews about me, the patients actually state that Dr. Tao actually listened to my concerns. Okay. If someone comes in about it and I'm immediately talking about something else, I listen to what they said. I always want to address the main, even if it is, you know, unfortunately due to some other problems, I can't treat your main concern, but it'll be at the top of our priority list. The patient then knows yeah. I listen. So we don't listen very well. That's a huge mistake we make as dentists. Yeah. It's so funny you say that too, because our biggest producers, they just ask the best questions. They're not fancy what they say. They just ask incredible questions. And you could tell they're leaning in. They work hard at this craft. And I'm sure that when you went through the training, there were epiphanies that you had. You're like, wow, like and listening behind what they say, not just what they say and all of that. So kudos to you, brother. That's awesome. One of the biggest things I also recommend and I'm going to is don't wear this in your wait, office. Wait, I got one and I have to put it in my bag all the time because it's so yeah, when I when I give case presentations, I take it off and remove it because, uh, you know, I will be distracted so many times, especially now. So we have a camera system in my house and every time it senses movements, it buzzes me. And during the day, because we're getting work done, it buzzes a hundred times. So I can't, I will look at my watch all the time. So I learned to take this off during my case presentations. 
because I don't want people to think I'm, I'm being distracted and ignoring them. That's really what that comes down to. So we need to listen and not be distracted to our patients. Have someone come in and take notes while you're listening. Don't sit there and taking notes because if you're taking notes, you're not listening. These are all things, these are all little, little tiny things that you can change to show the patient that you care and are listening to them. Right, right. And these components are always important. I've heard so many dentists say, the more you do up front, like listening, connecting, with the, the less you have to do later, the less like hard work it is. Because it really, you know, argue with me if you want. At the end of the day, Len, it still comes down to one thing, trust. Like mm -hmm. that's the bottom line. The bottom line is trust, right? Yeah, hundred percent. So if they, I have so many patients who come in the office and they say they've already trust me because of what they read about me online. So it's simply, I have to find something that's going to work financially for them. And these people are, are going to say, yes, that is setting me up for success because of what online says about me. My previous patients have put reviews online and that's how this all connects to what I do anyway, because if you don't have the reviews, you don't have the trust. If you don't have the trust. The patients aren't necessarily coming in unless they're referrals um, by existing patients. And I get a lot of traffic online as well. And they trust me before they come in the office. Right. Now, I love, I love, you got to share this because I was just on your podcast. I love how you end your podcast. It's so good. Can you share that on here? Because I now, when you said that, I could see the universe connecting. Like say, say what you say at the end of your podcast. Yeah, well, well, I always say that there's, there's words that, there's only three words that matter. Your reputation matters. Okay. And it does. It's like, I think your reputation is as important as your credit score. If you have a bad reputation, you can't do business. If you have bad credit, you can't do anything, right. you know? So I, I, the, you, the reputation, and this is, this goes back to what I've been talking about ever since I was a, a new speaker is how important reputation is. I've never gotten off that high horse. I mean, that was how I came to the, the industry. That's what I've been pro pro promoting for, you know, 10 years now is how important a reputation is to be able to do anything online. Okay. Right. Um, and how to do anything in your practice, your reputation matters so much. And that's really what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, when you talk about the new generation of how people communicate, either through, you know, we spend so much time on these things, it's crazy, but your reputation, it's all about relationships, totally get it. But your reputation is a great supporter of the relationships. And that's, that's really what you're talking about. You're talking about people seeing you online, then they get the chat, then they see you as a listener. And now it's starting to come together for them. And what's, what would be some of the, the further steps we would take a look at in the art of selling? So, so I think the, the biggest, the biggest thing I think you need to do is, is learn what I call the disarming technique. And the reason that I'd say that is because if you have a patient who's nervous, if you have them um, at a point where they're not willing to even let you in their brain, if you don't disarm them, they're not, they're not buying. And, and I always tell new doctors to go ahead and ask permission to record the case presentation. And there'll be a time in the, during the conversation, if they're, especially if they're scared, that they relax in the chair. Right. after being really tense and they relax. Okay. And when they relax again, I, I will always say, if you can find them money, they're going to say yes. So I talk about a number of steps during this, this disarming technique. So one is establishing rapport, which I hope to do before they even come in the office. Okay. I don't call hygiene patients, but I call patients that are in my office before they come in and I welcome them to the office unless I've spoken to them before. Okay. Or I chatted with them. So I want to establish rapport with the patient, get to know them, get to know them better. And it's not necessarily on a dental level either. Okay. I want to show that I care and I'm there for them if they need me. Right. Ask key interview questions. So what brings you in today? When was the last time you saw a dentist? The last dental visit you had? So my patients fill out two in, uh, unique forms. One is called uh, a comfort menu, which I can't use as much now because of COVID, okay? So it's blankets okay. and pillows and paraffin hand for their, uh, wax for their hands, their like interactions now, uh, what music they wanna listen to, um, do they want any uh, um, medication or you know, pre-op medication? Um, so I wanna make sure they know that we care about them. And then I also have them fill out what's called a please handle me with care form. Okay. And the please handle me with care form is the, um, the form they fill out to ask them what they, what problems they had at previous dental offices. They don't like lying back for long periods of time. They don't like, they want to know the cost up front. You know, they don't like cotton, cotton in their mouth because I want to give them the experience they that was better than any other experience. Or as Anissa Holmes says, a wow experience. Okay. Right. So I ask these key introductory questions. Okay. I also establish that time is not an obstacle. So I'm, I want them to know that I can get some work done in the time frame they need it to be. Okay. I remove the fear. I, rem I use reassuring terms, painless, 
easy, simple. I've done this so many times, pain-free. My needles are absolutely painless, okay? And I always point out, and this is the one clinical thing I talk about in my seminars, how I give a painless needle. Because I ask how many people truly give a painless needle and maybe 25% of the attendees tell me they give a painless needle. So I actually have learned over the years to give a painless needle because they talk about that. They talk about the painless dentistry, okay? I emphasize how often I've done a procedure um, and I ensure that I can make the treatment affordable for them. And if you can make it affordable to them, they will buy it, like I said. You know, I also like to use everyday languages. I try to, you know, b b bring it to them on a third or second grade level rather than a dental level. You know, we're so you're, so not, you're not using equilibration and distal and buccal and occlusion or anything like that? No, and I talk about, when I talk about um, uh, periodontal disease, I talk about, you know, uh, gum inflammation or, gu you know, gum infection. I use the, love the word infection because patients relate to infection. If you tell them they have an infection, they want to get rid of it, right. okay? So, like, if they have a periapical pathology that needs a root canal, I tell them they have a pus pocket at the top of their tooth, okay? If they, if they hear pus, they think of infection, okay? Right. So, I use terms that they understand as well. And, you know, I, I'm very careful how I put it, on, put it in there, but I also love using analogies as well. So when you use analogies, patients really relate to what you're saying to them. Yeah, very powerful to make sure that you're using language that they, they understand. So good. What other components are in the art of selling that you teach? Uh, one of the other things, I talked about active listening, but I also talk about the importance of body language and how important body language is. Because there's a, there's a, a, a psychologist I studied, again, many years ago called Albert, Mar Albert Morabian. And he came up with this 738-55 model of communication where 55% is visual, 38% is vocal, and only 7% is verbal, the words that we speak. But we spend so much time on the verbal stuff that we said, we're, we're not paying attention to 93% of the other things. Right. So the, the, the body language that we do, how we, how we talk with our eyes, how we talk with our nods, okay? So nodding is a great way to have, you know, body language skills with the patient. You know, we're wearing a mask now as well. So, you know, it's hard when you're wearing a mask to smile, but smile is a great body language skill. So if yeah. I'm at a distance from a patient now, I have this big smile on my face. It shows I want, I'm, I'm happy to see them. Okay. Now, when I go speak, see them in the chair, I obviously put a mask on. So it prevents that. So body language is something very important I talk about as well. It's the art of eye contact. Okay. Yeah. So you want to squint when you're listening. You open up when you want to say something. You want to squint when you're, you know, so they know you're understanding them. These are things you're, these are so inconsequential, but the patients will pick up on it and it's in their mind that you're listening to them. And that's really, really important. Okay. Yeah. So the art of eye contact is one. And then it's, there's nods as well. So you have the single nod, which just means like I'm doing here, you right. know, it really shows someone you're listening. Okay. Right. Okay. You, you also have the multiple nods. I'm not talking about a bobblehead nod. It's just the, the multiple nods basically makes them sure, makes them show you understand what they're saying. Okay. Then you have the exaggerated slow nod. Okay. Which is like what? Like that. Ah, yeah, I, I see uh, the exaggerated slow nod. Again, it's so imperceptible, but the patient will pick up on that. Okay. And the, and the best one is, is the suggestive nod. So when, when somebody is saying, um, when I say to someone, so, you know, if I go ahead and get you some financing that you can afford, you're going to go ahead and accept treatment, correct? So, you know, it, it's that suggestive nod that you're doing. So if I can find money for you that you can afford, you'll be able to, you'll go ahead and accept treatment. So it's just the nod doing that, that they're picking up on. They're, they're going to say yes to that. How else would they, they're, they're going to go no. Right. So the, the, it's, it's called the, again, it's, it's the, the important of body language. And again, it's album Moravium study that you can look at. That's really, yeah. really powerful. I'm going to try with teenagers. So I have teenage daughters. You're going to be home at 11 o'clock, right? Like, like we talked. <laughs> yeah. Like that's, that, that should work. You know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be as, as like suggestive as that, but right. you know, it should be more imperceptible. You know, if, if, if I, and you can do this, if, um, so you, you've got curfew tonight or whatever you want to say to them, you know, I'm, I can expect you to home by seven, 11 o'clock tonight. Right. Right. Oh, so wow. just that is really, really important as well. You, people think I'm nuts when I teach this and I do it very well live, but virtual. And I show them, I, I take off my glasses so you can actually see it because I have a reflection in the screen, but people think I'm nuts when I do this, but when they actually work on it and practice it, like I practice it, I practiced it. The, the body language was probably one of the biggest increases in my case acceptance by learning how to do that. Yeah, no, I don't think you're nuts at all. I mean, when I was 25, I had a mentor make me take the Dale Carnegie course. And my first thought was, 
I don't need to learn how to shake hands and like make, but it was 11 weeks and I'll never forget. It was some of the most foundational stuff, how to even take a compliment. Like a lot of times we deflect compliments, but there's so many things. And it's very interesting that you talk about this because we've got another generation. I don't, I don't ever want to put people in buckets, but there are some times when we get clients or dentists that are young, they don't know how to make eye contact. They, I mean, they got, I'm like, look, at, look at the patient. No, when you're talking, like, look at them because they're looking down at something or they'll be looking at a screen or something. And I'm like reference, this is a human that's attached to these teeth type of a thing. So I think we can't spend enough time on the things that matter um, as they as they relate to more connection with human beings. A hundred percent so. And if you don't connect, they're not buying from you. Okay, right. it's that simple. If they don't feel a connection, they're gonna go to someone else. They're gonna say, you know what, I wanna think about it and you'll never hear from them again. And part of that reason is, is we have a very, and I'm sure you see this, we have very poor follow-up skills in our practice. When a patient says maybe, most practices have no way of reaching back out to them. Right. You know, they, they, go, they go one day, one week, one month, two months. <laughs> but if you don't have someone doing it and doing it effectively, these people, are, they're not going to reach out to you. You have to do the follow-up with them. And we're not good at that. Right. right. That is so true. That is so true. So what else do we need to know about the art of selling? Like what, 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 what about when it comes to the fees and the specifics yep. and then, cause that's, I mean, I, I got a reference. Linda Miles told me years ago, she said, Kirk, 70% of all case acceptance failure happens between the clinical conversation and the money. Do you think that's pretty true from your observations or not? Or is it a little bit more skewed than that? No, I, I think it's in, you know, patients, if you if you get them to understand the value of what you're giving them, I think the financial conversation is much easier. If patients don't value what they're getting, they're, it doesn't matter how much you charge for something, they're, they're going to say no. So I think that's the big disconnect that people have sometimes. But I think, um, you know, and that's why I want to do it myself, by the way, because when I left the office and passed it off to someone else, that whether it was a couple minutes or a couple of seconds, there was a definite change in the way it was between me going in, me leaving, and then someone coming in and taking over the conversation. So I actually prefer to do it myself because I just sit in the room until they either say, go screw yourself or, <laughs> or yes, I'm accepting treatment. I mean, that's really what it's about. Right. So I, I think what, whether it's a, a, an office coordinator or you know, treatment coordinator or a dentist, you have to be comfortable asking specific questions when it comes to money. Right. Okay. And one of those questions is how much money can you afford? Okay. How much of a monthly pay, pay, uh, payment can you make? Okay. And do they have good credit? So okay. do you ask the patients then if they Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. So, okay. and, I, and, and here's why, because I, because care credit is, which is a great company and I use them a ton, doesn't give, does not give money to everyone. So if you're only using care credit, which I did for quite some time. And again, I'm a huge fan of care credit. I use it all the time. Um, I was missing out on because they only basically approved like 60% of my patients. There was a 40% of my population that would not get money. And that's because they didn't have the best credits. Okay. So one of the tips that if you're going to use care credit um, and you're not in California, you can actually help the patient apply for them. Now I do it on the, the patient side, not the doctor side. Okay. So I'm on the patient side, not the doctor side. So we, I help the patients and I say to them, look, uh, there's an application that you can fill out. I'm very fast. I have all your information here. Can I help you fill out the application? Okay. Well, when, if they get, if they get uh, approved, we can celebrate together. Congratulations. You got $12,000. Okay. Yeah. But if they get denied for whatever reason, it tells the, them and it tells me what their credit score was. So yeah. I know if I can then look at other companies out there. So I have companies that will go as low as five, 50, 560 and get the money. And again, the people that don't have good credit know they don't have good credit. Number right. one. Okay. I've only had probably two or three people ever that says I have really good credit and their credit really is lousy. Okay. Um, so they know, and if they say it's good and they don't get approved, there's usually some reason for it. Um, but I know that information and I can take it and decide, can I get the money from another company? Right. So one of the companies, go ahead. No, no, you, you go, you go. And I have a question after you say what you say. So one of the companies that I, I use is a company called Lending Point. Okay. So Lending Point will, will give you up to $15,000 in money, the patient $15,000. And if they have, they have no interest options, uh, 24, uh, excuse me, uh, 
six, 12, and 24 months, no interest financing options. Okay. And it's five, seven, or 10% of the practice, which is cheaper than some of the other companies that are out there. But if the patient has to finance, whether it's three years or four years, it's a 1% fee to a practice. So if you're doing a $10,000 loan, they're only charging the practice $100 for that loan. That is a bargain. That's bargain money. It's better than even a credit card. So wow. that's why you need to look. And there's another company called Scratch Pay that I highly recommend. They're in, they were big in the vet space. They charge a flat rate of 7% to the practice. Again, less than ideal credit scores can use them. So I use a combination of all those. I still give care credit a ton of money, okay? But I use a combination and there's no cost to using these companies, okay? Right. They 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 don't charge you fees just to sign up for them. So I sign up for them because I want to have them in my armamentarium so I can get some people money. And when I get the money, they have no tr they they always accept treatment. Really, I don't want right. people to say no to that because they can't get any other way necessarily. Totally, totally. We got a good friend of ours, Dr. Michelle Bishop. She asked this question on the feed in Facebook: Are you fee for service or do you accept insurance? So do you discuss insurance as well? with your patients? Great question, Michelle. That was a really good question. So um, I, when I first bought my practice 14 years ago, I need, I knew that I, I had a team to support me, but I needed to know how to run the business myself just in case a team member wasn't there. So I act as the backup front desk person. So believe it or not, over the years, I've probably called insurance companies just as much as somebody at the front desk. So I've learned a lot about dental insurance. Right. So I'm comfortable talking about dental insurance. I am a fee for service practice though. Okay. So I always tell patients we can help them with their insurance. We do accept assignment of benefit though. The only ones we won't accept really money from is care, um, uh, Delta dental and United Concordia where I am in, in Philadelphia. So they will have the patients will have to pay in full, full and then they'll get reimbursed, but everybody else will send me the, the insurance. So if somebody needs, has $2,000 maximum, I will tell them, look, you've got $2,000 coming to you. We'll maximize the insurance. Your out of pocket is now $12,000 instead of $14,000. So I use it in the conversation. Right. Very good. I love this. I love this. So now we're getting into the nitty gritty and the details. Like this is really good. So you've spent a lot of time studying this like a lot of time what else would you think it would be important for dentists or team members to know about the art of selling in this whole process you're you're designing a whole process here this isn't an event like it isn't like oh just say this it's a whole entire process what else have you learned that would be important for us to know so on how to handle patient objections there's certain ways to handle certain questions they 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 say so if that if that's too much money Okay. Well, you can break things up. You don't. And by the way, I want to mention, I phase a lot of treatment. Okay. If someone needs a ton of treatment, I do not want them leaving because of sticker shock. So I ask them, can I phase treatment for you to make it more affordable? If I can, if they need a full arch done, I can't phase it. But if I can do a quadrant over the couple of years, it, the, the price to them seems less. I went, so handling a patient objection is a big thing. I like to present if something is, by the way, is let's say it's $5,000. Okay. Um, you know, I always tell them, I always lead my, how much money it costs. I don't say, oh, your treatment's $5,000. Okay. I say it's yay money over 24 months if you get approved. So that is the cheapest it's going to be for them. So they know that they can make a monthly payment of, you know, $250 over 12 months, you know, twice, you know, over two years, that's going to make the money that they need. Okay. So I always present to them first. I give the second option in my office. They can pay over time. So if it's a crown, it can be two visits. If it's a denture, it's five visits. So that's the second option. And the third option is they can pay in full, which is always going to be the most money. It sounds like $5,000. I'll give you a 5% discount if you do that. And they save 250 bucks. Right. So they know the cheapest option is, is presented first, not last. So I don't shy away from, from uh, third party financing at all. I, I embrace it and I want to use it as much as possible because I'd rather have 90% of something than 0% of zero. And if a patient says no, they don't, they don't spend any money in my practice. Okay. Go a little farther than that. Go back to that because I've heard that forever. And I agree with that. You'd rather have 90%, but you know, talk, I get these too. I don't want to give them up all that percent. Like you don't, you'd rather, cause these people can't afford dentistry in the first place with their normal means. Correct. Just go a little deeper on what you just said. Why is that? Because I know that if I can't get make treatment affordable for them, I'd rather take the 10% hit and, and have them do treatment rather than have them where they can't afford the payment and they go elsewhere because someone will find the money for them. So I've decided that I'm willing to give them the, I'm willing to, to accept 
the money from or less money from using financing companies to get the patient a cheaper rate to be able to come into my office. I made that decision a long time ago. One of the biggest changes I made in my practice was when I started doing Invisalign and I started going from 12 months to 24 months. It's a bigger hit to my practice. It's four percentage points. Okay. Um, so it's $200, but am I going to let it 200? I don't, I don't worry about those small little tiny things in my life. That's an easy decision. To, do I want, do I want a $5,000 case or, or do I want to lose $200 or do I not want the $5,000 case and the patient leaves the office because I wouldn't give them 18 months or 24 months when they need it. I don't worry about that in my practice. That's an easy decision for me. That's awesome. That is awesome. Cool. Well, I know we're, we're going to have to do way more. I, I mean, I want to go into the reviews thing with you. Like you're a pretty sharp guy. Let's, let's bring this home. What last thoughts, you know, do you have on the art of selling dentistry or presenting dentistry? Well, there's a lot. Of, I mean, I give, I do this in a three and a half hour workshop over zoom. So, I mean, they're taken through the entire step. They get a, they get a workbook that's 40 pages long. Okay. So they get, they get it's, it's action. And I always like to state, you know, I always learn something. Um, one of my key uh, quotes is um, action without, uh, excuse me, education without action is just entertainment. Right. Okay. So I always tell people when I give a seminar, they're going to be thoroughly entertained because I really enjoy live seminars, but if they don't take action, then that's on them. And it's just education then. So, uh, or just entertainment, I should say. So I want them to take action. So I give them action steps during this, during this three and a half hour workshop to basically go back on the practice the next day and start implementing the things I teach. So, um, I think you have to look yourself in the mirror and say, can I do better? Can I get a better case acceptance? A lot of people don't even know their case acceptance. They have no clue what their case acceptance is. So you have to know what your case acceptance is first. I, I know they all say yes, right? You've heard that one. No, yeah. everybody says yes, right? Yeah. But it's not, it's not true. Yeah, I, I actually have a practice. They were on dental Intel and they really never used it. And they do $2 million a year. Okay, so he's very successful but his case acceptance was 30%. <laughs> so even if he doubles that, you can just imagine how much, how much, because the benchmark should be about 85% case acceptance. And my definition of case acceptance is a little different. My, I want the patient to say yes to something within the treatment plan, because if they say no to, to everything, that means they're only coming back for six months recal if they stay in the practice. So if they right. start doing treatment, the chance of them doing more is much higher percentage than them doing nothing. So um, that's just a very big part of, of what I do. So you know, look, if you, if you look yourself in the mirror and say, you know what, I need help with my case acceptance. My advice is, is to take my workshop. It's not expensive. It's a very it's three and a half hours. It's, it's recorded. So you can show it to the rest of your team. Um, and it's a lot of fun. We have a blast. Um, it's not, it's over done over zoom. There's only like 12 attendees maximum. So it's a very small group of docs, um, or, or team members. And, um, I I think it will be really helpful to them to, to learn the way I do things as a practicing dentist, but someone who's taken the additional steps to learn how to run their business. Yeah, I love it. So if somebody's listening now for the benefit of people that it might be listening on iTunes or wh whatever, I know people are going to want to reach out to you. How do I get a hold of you? I also want you to tell them about your podcast and how they can listen to your podcast. So let's start, let's start with wherever you want to start on that. Yeah. So the first thing, if they want the, the, the website to take a look at the information on the workshop, on the workshop is, is workshop, the dot dr lentow. So workshop dot drlentow.com. That okay. will take them away. They can look at the everything about the workshop. They can sign up for some dates. Um, there's multiple dates available. So they can sign up and look to see what's there. So that's number one. If they want to contact me directly, they, I'll give you my cell phone number because I'm uber responsive. They can text me. They can email me. My email is there, len at drlentow.com. Uh, and my said, I'm fine giving it out. Um, it's 215-292-292. 2100. That's my personal cell phone. My phone's been buzzing, but I am responsive. And I always tell people if I'm not responsive, it's because I'm drilling in someone's mouth, I'm sleeping, or I'm in the air and I can't respond, or I'm giving a workshop or a presentation. And this counts as that. So, um, but I'm uber responsive. Now, my podcast um, comes out Fridays at 1 p.m., it's released on a weekly basis. It's called the Raving Patients Podcast raving patients. I have a Facebook group with about 2,700 dentists called raving patients as well. So they can join that. There's no sales allowed. It's all education about online reviews and just getting your practice to be, to do a better job. Awesome, buddy. Well, I appreciate you so much. I know we're going to see so many more 
good things from you in the future. You're a great thinker. Uh, if you haven't seen Len speak, you got to see him speak. Check out. I, I'd love to be on your Zoom course. I know you're going to make it fun. And I agree with you. Like Education's got to be applicable. You also have to make it fun. And you do a great job of that. I, I just appreciate our friendship. And it's so good to see you, man. Well, well I, will, I, will, I will give you a free admittance to my my art of the work. Uh, by the way, they can use the code RAVING, R-A-V-I-N-G, if they want to take the workshop. And they can get 50% off the cost. So. They can use the word raving for 50% off um, and sign up and they'll save uh, 50% on the cost of the admitted step. But I'll give you a free one so you can join and, and just watch it and, and, and see, what I, see what I do. Oh, dude, you're the best. Um, so awesome, awesome. Well, I really appreciate you, brother. Stick around while we say goodbye um, to everybody else. And that's my iPhone wristwatch ringing. <laughs> I, I got to turn that thing off or hide it or do something. But um, stick around. Uh, <laughs> Thank you guys for watching, tuning in to the Best Practices Show. If you enjoyed today, which I hope you did, just do us a favor. Click the share button, share with your friends. Keep sending us suggestions for things that you want to see, not only from Lynn, but from other key opinion leaders. And we're going to line them up and you will see them on the future Best Practices Shows. Again, check out the Facebook group. Check out the notes page. You'll see everything that Len shared. Uh, you'll find that there. Until we see you guys next time. Keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day.